and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Welcome to episode 80, the end of series special. I'm taking a short break before the next series, but let's get straight into this one. To be honest, I had no idea what I would do for this episode. I spent ages flicking through magazines, hoping to get some inspiration, and suddenly I saw this advert. A rather intriguing bit of hardware thing to improve the original Spectrum's rubber keyed dead flesh keyboard. As a simple keyboard overlay, albeit a hardware one, it looked like it could work well. I'm not sure how many of these sold, and I've only ever seen one on eBay once, but I was beaten to that by someone who sniped me for 50 pence. There was also this, a game board, and again it fitted over the original keyboard and allowed the fitting of pegs for the game keys. I can see how this would help if you hadn't played the game before, or the game had a lot of keys to remember. Another simple idea to help with the keyboard came in the shape not of hardware, but in lesser, smaller packages. These were not common, and they were limited to a number of games that used them. Elite, for example, a game with many keys, had this keyboard helper plus an overlay for the Spectrum. Lords of Midnight also had many commands and was supplied with this. And Quicksilver included smaller plastic overlays in several of their early titles. This is the one for Timegate, and this one for Space Intruders. They slotted neatly over the cursor keys like this, and gave an extra bit of added value to the game. A simple idea, but effective. These are not always present when you buy games online, so if you want them, check before spending your cash. I'm not sure if it helped the game or not. Once you got used to the keys after hours of playing, and yes, we played the games for hours back in those days, then the keys became almost second nature. If you had a game where the keys were numerous or hard to remember, then Print and Plotter, amongst others, came to the rescue with their do-it-yourself overlays. These came in packs that allowed you to make simple overlays from sheets of plastic with holes pre-cut. They covered the whole keyboard, and they were supplied with ready printed stickers or empty stickers that you could write on and place next to the keys you wanted. The previous owner of this pack obviously played Transam, Alchemist, Flight Simulation plus a few others. There were many interesting adverts in the multitude of magazines that I've got, including one that I paid no attention to originally, but turning the page and seeing it now, well, it gives so many odd vibes. See what you think. Prepare yourself. See what I mean? Yeah, let's quickly move on, shall we? There are a lot of other odd adverts that I found too. Take this. Now I'm not sure about a lot of content in this image. Is this bloke looking at this naked creature in an odd way? And with the technology to build clubs and shields, you'd have thought close with the next thing. Now this one, mm, yeah. If it was a more modern image, you could claim bad photoshopping. I'm not sure what this is trying to convey, either a giant tiger eating a man, or a tiny man living in a tiger's mouth. Either way, very odd. Right, um, well this just looks weird. Three blokes with disproportionate heads, and a cat that doesn't like what it's seen up that bloke's loincloth. Axe held the wrong way, and is this Apollo Creed from the Rocky films? And what's that under his cape? Moving on, and yeah. If that woman is being squeezed as hard as the image implies, she'd be dead. Her head would have exploded off her shoulders like a bullet. And that bloke, expecting to help matters and running to rescue with a hammer? Hmm. Keeping with the Kong theme and, yes, well, this is just bad. The face, the man with the hammer again, the girl that looks bored with the whole situation, and bits of, what is that, banana or barrel covering the beast's nipples? Talking of nipples, we all remember this game, right? This is the first advert, and it's a brilliant piece of art. But it upset many people, because it depicted a woman's nipples. Oh my, the horror. So, the following month, they fixed it, by pasting the company name over the offending bits of anatomy. And then the following month, they put this out. Yeah, not at all bodged over the top, is it? Hmm. On to the next one, and this dragon. Where do you start? Head's way too big, wings way too small. I mean, it wouldn't even get off the ground. The man with something, 
Yeah, it's pretty bad, isn't it? Now, a uh, man with hat. With horn. One horn has morphed into a giant snake thing, and there's a tiny woman badly merged onto the top. Okay, not as bad as the others, I suppose, but what does it all mean? A magic hat, a tiny woman, or is it yin and yang? Who knows? How about this one, then? Yeah. Is that pain, or some other emotion he's feeling? And where's his other hand? Where do the giant's hands fit into things as well? Surely not a two-headed monster with ginormous hands. And why is he so excited by it all? From hands to... well... hmm... Well, there's definitely something wrong with this man's lower region. It looks like he's accidentally sat on an ant's nest. And the monster, well, it looks more confused than scary. Maybe it's seen his arse. And this one. Do I have to say anything here? Best keep quiet, really, and move on after you've had enough time to take it all in. Lastly, well, the two main elements are drawn really nicely, but somehow they just decided to stick them together in this haphazard way. Why does the top half have no armour? Surely that's a weak spot right there. Oh, I've just found this. Isn't that Thanos from Guardians of the Galaxy? I'm sure there are more that I've missed, but the days of amateur artwork have long since, and sadly gone. There was also a trend in the early adverts to use cockpit views. Take these examples. Mercenary, in a cockpit. Alien destroyers, in a cockpit. Imagine games, in a... yes, you get the idea. Star Commando. Various games from Quicksilver. And this is interesting because it's advertising two games. Both arcade clones, Meteor Storm, obviously an Asteroids clone, in the middle window, and Space Intruders, a Space Invaders clone, in the right-hand window. Now, the left-hand window is definitely Scramble, but Quicksilver never released a Scramble clone for the Spectrum. They did for the ZX81, so maybe they're just reusing the adverts. Meteoroids, in a cockpit, yes, we're back on that theme again. Penetrator, obviously. Okay, I think we'll stop there. I didn't want to revisit magazines, because I covered them in the gruelling episode 40. But here we are, back amongst the musty paper smell. Let's play some games instead. When the Plus 2 was released in 1986, it had a set of software bundled with it. These titles are probably easily recognised by anyone around at that time, because of the inlay design. They came in this rather nice box, inside which are six games that formed the Soft 888 pack. There are two main reasons for bundling games with computers. First, they were cheap and often rubbish, and made the computer bundle look better value for money, especially for the buyer who may not have known what the games were like. Or, they were stellar titles designed to show off the system. What will these be then? Let's take a look. Here they are. We have Punchy, Disco Dan, Crazy Golf, Alien Destroyer, Oh Mummy, and Treasure Island. So let's jump straight in. Oh Mummy was originally released by Gem Software in 1984, and is in fact a 16K game. Yes, they bundled the 16K game with the new 128K machines. And yes, it's a very simple Amidar clone. The graphics are 8 pixel character squares, the sound is just simple beeps, and well, I suppose it plays okay if you like typing games. This does not show off the 128 machine at all. In fact, it doesn't even show off the 16k machine either. If you don't know Amidar, you simply paint all the pathways gaining points. However, this game has an Egyptian theme to it, and some of the squares have items that gain you extra points, like scrolls or keys. And the keys are important, you need to be able to find that to get to the exit to the next level. And the exit is that green cross bottom right. There are a number of chasing enemies depending on the level you're on, and the intelligence seems rather dull, but it is a 16k game after all.
So that was Oh Mummy. The next one we have is Disco Dan, again by Gem Software and originally released in 1984. This game has two main screens, and the story involves stopping nuclear reactors from exploding. The first part sees you running down a 3D tunnel, and you have to avoid potholes and jump over the lasers. Every now and again a mutant Pac-Man appears, and these have to be avoided or jumped. This section is quite nice. The graphics are okay and smooth, and the sound is well used. Control is good too. If you get to the end, it takes you to the next part, which is a Cubert style game. You have to change the colours and numbers on the discs by jumping on them. Each time you jump on a disc, the number will reduce, eventually reaching zero, and that is your goal. However, they are randomly increased by a spinning nasty thing that moves about, changing the discs back. Eventually, if you don't reduce them, they will change to red, and red discs can't be jumped on or you'll die. The control for this is pretty tricky, as it's a rotate and jump mechanism. Two keys rotate down through all of the directions, and the jump key will jump in that direction. And this is different from the usual Cubert controls. But once you get used to them, it's not too bad. This game has nice sounding graphics and is quite fun to play, and it gives you some variety with the two different sections. If you complete this disc section, it takes you back to the 3D tunnel, but this time with more of everything. And now on to Alien Destroyer, originally by QMAR Computers from 1984. And as you can tell, this is a Galaxian clone. The graphics are large, but a bit jerky, and the control is sometimes unresponsive, especially when there's a lot on screen. Things speed up as you make your way through the wave, and on the second level they start to swoop down, which really does slow the gameplay down a bit. The background stars seem to draw on one at a time, and then all of a sudden appear at once, which is a bit strange. Sound is well used though, and the gameplay is, well, like a slow, less responsive version of the arcade game. And that just about sums it up really but it is fun to play for a while. Next we have Punchy from Mr. Micro, originally released in 1983. Now this game was originally called Hunchy, obviously based on the arcade game Hunchback. After some legal wranglings, the names was changed to Punchy and the game slightly altered in levels and speech. The original had speech saying Esmeralda, but Punchy obviously doesn't. <laughs> The speech and music are quite good, when you first hear them, but the gameplay is awful. The jumps are not high enough, and so it takes a long time to get used to the timings. Once past the first screen, we get to the famous rope swing. Or you would if it was the arcade, but this has been replaced in this game by, I think, a magic carpet? Whatever it is, it's almost impossible to land on, because of the jumping mechanism mentioned before. Eventually though, I made it. The next screen has empty battlements, so quite easy to get past. And then on to the next one with men poking up sticks. Again, not too bad. And so it goes on. Eventually though, you'll fall foul of the jump mechanism. The speech soon gets on your nerves too. A game to experience, I suppose, and then move on quickly. Bye. 
Next we have Crazy Golf, again from Mr. Micro, and again originally released in 1983. This looks like it's written in BASIC. You control the range of your shot using Q and W, which is shown as a red line on the top of the screen, and the rotation of the shot using O and P, shown by an arrow circling the ball, top left. Once you're happy, you press ENTER, and the square ball moves around the screen, bouncing off the walls, as you'd expect. And you keep doing this until eventually you reach the hole. I like crazy golf games, the Amiga had a great one called Amiput, and there are a few others for more modern devices too. This one though, is a bit dull in every respect. The holes are pretty much void of detail, sometimes there's a pattern, but little else. Sound are simple beeps and poor beeper tunes, and control is slow and the whole thing just plods on. Let's move on. Finally we have Treasure Island. The instructions indicate this game has many parts, so let's give it a go. What the hell is this? It's like a poor man's frogger. And it's impossible. Dead again. Is this really the first part? Oh god. Once you manage to get past this part, we get, ah, oh dear, dead again, hmm. Let's have another go. Nope. You have to time your jumps to avoid those arms to get to the last part, and this is so frustrating. So, so far we've had a frogger clone and a sort of hunchback thing. I could never get to the third part though, so I had to use the RZX playback. And this is where the majority of the game is. And this is a bit like Sabre Wolf, really. You run around, killing pirates, collecting swords and using them to kill pirates, and searching for treasure. I'm not really sure why the first two parts were needed, because this section alone is a good enough standalone game. The graphics are a bit flickery, and there are only two sound effects used, and you'll find yourself running around in silence most of the time, but the game map is quite large. Yes, it's a maze variant, and some of the graphics do look a little bit like Sabre Wolf, but some people like this type of game. You have to learn the routes, and which pirates guide which exits. And it's a nice change from the other titles in this pack. If I would have got the whole game pack as part of my brand new Spectrum Plus 2, I would have thought the whole machine was a bit of a letdown. Not only does it not use 128k of memory, but it doesn't even use the AY sound chip, some of the things the 1 to 8 was sold on. Yes, they were free, but I think there were a lot better games around at this time that could have been used. As many of you know, I love typing games. I like to see how they work, and what other people were doing at the same time I was getting into programming. Magazines were littered with many different offerings, from poor arcade clones to original games created with a few dozen lines of code. Some magazines even produced machine code listings for the patient typers. These games were free, only costing the price for the magazine, and a little time to sit there typing them all out. For those not wanting to do this, there were several options. Your computer magazine offered Telsoft, a program that let you download their listings over the phone line. And then there was Prestel and Micronet 800, providing some games to download, and also local bulletin boards would offer a few titles as well. However, one magazine went a bit further and made some of their games available to buy. Personal Computer World published this collection of games. There are 26 titles here, all for just $5.95. I'm not going through every single one of them here, but for those interested, I will play them all on a Patreon video coming shortly. So let's dive in then. The case is nice and much bigger than I expected, and it comes with a booklet, or more accurately, a book. Inside, you will find all of the games on the tape, in listing format, 
accompanied my descriptions of what the code does. This was meant to help any coders understand the games and how they worked, which was a nice touch. Let's try a few games then. This is Sheepdog Trial. You have to guide three sheep into the pen at the bottom of the screen. You move your sheepdog around, which in turn forces the sheep to move. Eventually you'll get them all in. Not a bad game I suppose for a typing, and something different than the usual things you come across. As you would expect it's a basic game, so the graphics are character based and the sound is limited and the control is often unresponsive. Let's try another one. This is Virus. Yes, it's a standard light cycles game. You control the white bits and have to block in the yellow virus. Again, it's a very basic game in every sense of the word and nothing really new. The response to key presses though makes this game pretty tricky. OK, from these few, I think we can guess the quality of this compilation, considering it only costs five ninety five. Next then is Planets. OK, this is not actually a game. It's a simulation of the four inner planets and their paths. Hmm. OK, let's move on. This is Cheese. You control a cat and have to intercept a mouse as it makes its way towards the cheese. The control is terrible, and it's sometimes tricky to get the position right as the mouse moves diagonally. When it gets to the cheese it eats its way through it, and when it's all gone it's game over. Well, this is exciting, isn't it? I got bored and wanted to see what happens when the mouse eats all the cheese. Nice effect when you die, and a high score. Okay, I think that's enough of that then. Because this compilation was released in 1983, the games are typical of what you'd find in magazines, so to save you typing them in, and probably making mistakes, I suppose $5.95 isn't a bad price. The book is good quality too, but the games are, well, you saw them for yourself. Well, we're coming up to the end of the episode, so let's have some fun. Many of you have Spectrum emulators on your smartphone and may be reliving those glory days when you travel or have a few spare minutes, possibly while waiting for a project manager to work out how to open a door to the meeting room. There are a few emulators to choose from, but I'm not going to go into them here. Instead, I'm going to take a look at other things you can do on your smartphone linked to the Spectrum. First we have this, Play ZX a tool to locate and play back TAP and TZX files on your phone so you can load them into your Spectrum in real time. The A to Z list makes finding a game easy and there's also a search option. Once selected, you may get a few different versions displayed. Pick the one you want, connect your phone as you would a normal cassette player and load a game as you would normally. And there you go, a game direct from the internet played on your phone and loaded straight into your Spectrum. A great little app if you want to load games the way they used to be loaded. Next we have Spectrum Eyes. This app lets you use your camera 
or take a picture from your gallery and convert it into all the glorious Spectrum screeny goodness. And when you're ready, you can save it as a PNG file and even export it into a real Spectrum tap file to load into a real machine. The quality of the final image really depends on the subject and lighting. Sometimes it works really well, others not so good. I like this app. It's great fun to mess about with, and I spent a lot of time taking pictures just to see how they would look on a specky. And lastly, we have something to really annoy your friends with. This is ZX Plectrum. You use your finger to change the pitch and loading sound, complete with loading bars, and try to get some kind of tune. Although, obviously, it's just there to make a hell of a racket and annoy people in the vicinity. But it's some fun nonetheless. So there you have it. Three Spectrum-related apps that are not emulators. If you've got a phone, go away and give them a try. And if you know of any others I've not covered, let me know in the comments. And I'll take a look at them, possibly in a later episode. So as this episode's going to go out around Christmas, shall we talk about Christmas games? Are you talking games about Christmas or Christmas or games you got at Christmas? Uh, maybe it should be games you got at Christmas because weren't Christmas games notoriously rubbish? They were really bad and I covered them in a previous Christmas special. So, so th <laughs> this is now about games you got at Christmas. Yeah. Okay. Now I have said this on my channel I think a few times but it's probably worth recapping. So in 1983 I got my Spectrum which I didn't know I was getting. Spectral Panic and Attic Attack. I think that was the best Christmas I've ever had. <laughs> so when was your first Spectrum Christmas? I want to say 82, but I, I, I think I, I... So I think it was very early 83 I got it. I'm, I don't know. The, the earliest photographs I've got are of some games wrapped in tinsel, which mm. I got for that Christmas, and some of them date to 1982 and some are 83, but I think it's 83, the Christmas of 83. Yeah, the biggest one is The Hobbit. That's probably the most well-known game. I, uh, very good game. Very good game, yeah. And, and the updated version as well, where people have changed, updated all the graphics, kept all the gameplay exactly the same, but updated the graphics and added, added graphic locations for locations that didn't have graphics from things like the IBM version and the Commodore version. That's a really good, yeah. really good update. Uh, another adventure. I seem to have a lot of adventure games here. The next one is Magic Mountain by Phipps Associates. That's another adventure game. Adventure 1 by Abasoft, which is a colossal cave, basically. Yeah. Uh, we've got Planet of Death by Arctic, another text game. We've got, the, yeah. we've got the Oracle's Cave, a sort of text graphic game. That was a great game. I love the Oracle's Cave. Yeah, I might uh, take that out and play it again. Transylvanian Tower, which was terrible. and the one, I quite liked it. It's, oh, it's in basic. It's an awful game. Didn't you have to shoot bats? You in did it? In, in the second level. You got bats, and you also had footprints, yeah. uh, so you knew where you'd been. Yeah. And then the the other one, the other most well known one, which I couldn't play for the life in me, but I and I have had requests to review it, which is Halls of the Things. Yeah, I've not played that. Never, ever, ever played it. A lot of people say it's a really good game because of the freedom that you've got, but I just found it really difficult. Maybe one day I'll pick it out in, in um, a segment called Games That I Can't Play, which I have did, did once for a previous one, but I can dig it out again, because that's certainly one of the games I can't play at all. We could, maybe we should do a Let's Talk About about that, because there's a few games that I, I can't yeah, play that's, as that's, well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on, what, your Christmas games, that you've got... That was 83, and... and then 84, I got a Ram Turbo interface. Yep. I got Daily Thompson's Decathlon and The Lords of Midnight. And The Lords of Midnight was quite an old game, but I'd been saying to my parents for ages and ages and ages I wanted it for Christmas. Right. Okay. I actually, I'd been asking for it for so long I'd forgotten I was asking for it. On Christmas Day, Daily Thompson's Decathlon with my new joystick and interface got a load of uh, play. How long did the joystick last? Uh, a few months. It, 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 I, didn't, I didn't whack it too hard. <laughs> Okay, well, and, and, and can you remember anything else? Any other games that you got around Christmas? Or I, re I remember my neighbour, my next door neighbour, who also had a Spectrum, got Pajama Armour. 
and we spent ages playing that. I remember going around to his after Christmas uh, dinner just to see what he got. What about you? What about you for Christmas 84 then? Oh, I'm trying to think. Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. Oh, that was the same year. It must have been. So for Christmas 84, I think I got Ghostbusters. And I got it because I'd seen the 64 version, or should I say heard the 64 version, and wanted yep. the same thing on my Spectrum. Yeah, it definitely was available for Christmas. My my neighbour got that as well. And funnily enough, I was going to say it was 85, but it must have been 84 when you got that. I don't think it was that good a game. It was a different game. It wasn't a, a platform game or a shooting game. It, it had lots of different elements. That, that, that's the only game I can think of at Christmas that I got. Well, I know, I know the next Christmas. Okay, on to 86 then. Yeah, 86 was Elite. Elite. There you go. There's yeah. a surprise. <laughs> and any other games apart from Elite? Oh, Jet Set. No, I only I only got Elite because it was fifteen quid. Oh, okay, okay. No, it was eighty six. Eighty six. Oh, no, hold on. That is eighty five, isn't it? I've got mixed up. Perfect. I actually did really well those Christmases. Getting getting Attic Attack eighty three, Lords of Midnight, and Dilly Thompson's Decathlon eighty four, and then Elite eighty five was a pretty good haul of games. That's not bad, is it? So, what would you like this Christmas, Spectrum-related? Spectrum-related this Christmas, I would like... um... I want my Spectrum next. (laughs) That's a good one, yes. (laughs) Soon, I suspect. The slightly dubious and possibly racist Afro kit. The Electro kit where you get to play lozenges on a stick. And the Latin kit where you can shake your maracas. Best not really put that in, I don't know. It's blasting all the way and your ship seems... It's blasting all the way and your ship seems very vastly... Riding high in the charts this month are ah, Bumjack 2. Bumjack, Jesus. <laughs> That's the end of this mammoth shootout. And if I have to play another centipede game, I'm going to explode. If you haven't guessed by the title, this is a version of the classic arcade <coughs> Cough Along with Paul. <coughs> this is Deep Core Reader. No, it's not a dirty sex film. <laughs> I can't pull in. As you shoot fleets of aliens, they drop. Somebody's got a power zone going. Oh, stop drilling. The game starts, but it doesn't tell you it started. It just starts, start, oh, start, 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 start. I shall have to rewrite that. I wanted to enjoy this game. I like to... <coughs> Jesus. <coughs> Coming up, we get the top-selling news. No, we don't. I don't know where they got the image from, but it's but it's certainly a bit crap, 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 crap. It looks like a six-year-old's drawn it. Ah. <clears throat> but it's certainly a bit, shall we say, odd. This is a hefty book that is nearly an inch thick and has a wide variety of contributors, including some well-known names like Fill In Later. Ah, oh, my script actually says Fill In Later. I need to check forcing a platform game into the film story. However, the excellent Lucas Arse, Adven- no, uh, Lucas Arse Adventures... <laughs> On the right, there are various selections to select. Of course you'd select a selection. What else would you select? The new machine is based on the previous Plus 2 model and will be replaced by a tape deck. What? Try again. <clears throat> As you shoot fleets of aliens, they drop power-ups and... Oh, God. <laughs> 